Well, folks, I've got 3.30, so we're going to go ahead and jump on in here. Um, thanks again for showing back up for our last talk, um, a part of this Otter Appreciation Day. Um, for those who were here for the advanced talk yesterday, there will be some overlap between this presentation uh, and uh, part of the radar stuff from yesterday, but there's actually a lot more background on radar in this presentation. Uh, and then we're going to actually step through the um, Hondo April 28th uh, event from a radar perspective. I know that Paul talked about it uh, in the last hour in that talk, uh, but you know we'll be uh, kind of really diving in uh, and applying some of what we've learned over the last two days radar-wise um, to look at that supercell. So let's go ahead and, and jump on in. So again, we'll, we'll just uh, first off go uh, down the brief history of the WSR-88Ds of the weather radars uh, across the Weather Service. Uh, again, we'll briefly touch on uh, the radar basics, some of which we covered yesterday, uh, including those uh, base and dual pole products. Uh, but then we'll really dive into interrogating uh, a supercell and you know, kind of take you through some of what we as forecasters at the National Weather Service do uh, in warning ops and what products we're looking at what different signs we see um, in, in supercells, you know, to issue things like severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And then we'll wrap up talking about some of the hydrologic products uh, from the radar, still from that April uh, event, uh, looking at things like multi-radar, multi-sensor, uh, and the different tools that we use um, for rainfall estimation, um, which uh, is a really big thing here in South Central Texas, since we have uh, big flooding events like the October uh, 13th and 14th event, like Paul talked about uh, just a little bit ago. Uh, so first off, uh, taking a step back and looking at the history of uh, weather radar. So the one sitting just outside our office, the one uh, up in Granger, the one in in, in, uh, in a Brackettville, um, those are WSR 88Ds, and it's actually the third iteration of uh, basically weather service radars. They started uh, back with the WSR 57s. Um, the first modern weather radar was deployed in the late 1940s, and so we've come a long way since then. Um, the WSR 57s, there were 66 sites across the U.S., uh, and a handful there that you see listed in Texas, um, but none uh, in our at least uh, local immediate area other than uh, the Hondo uh, WSR uh, 57 there. Um, supplementing that uh, was the WSR 74, which added 62 radars to the network, uh, and you can see a lot more uh, Texas radars were added, including one in Austin uh, that ran through 1995. Uh, and then uh, the WSR-88D was really the first Doppler radar, that's the D being added to the end of the name there, um, and it was basically to replace that whole network of aging WSR-57s. Um, the first one was installed in 1992, and they are actually a joint project between the Department of Defense, specifically the Air Force, the Department of Commerce, us, the National Weather Service, and then the FAA with the TDWRs um, or the terminal Doppler radars that are at some of the bigger airports across the country. Um, we don't have any of those in South Central Texas, but DFW uh, and Houston do have some TDWRs. Uh, there are 13 uh, WSR 88Ds across the state of Texas, um, and some of the big improvements uh, from those is in 2008. Uh, we got super resolution data. Um, so if you were to look back in history at, um, say, the Gerald tornado, you're going to see one kilometer uh, pixels, basically the, the radar data you're looking at. Now we're looking at quarter kilometers. So we've got that super resolution data. A dual pole was added in and around 2011, 2012, uh, and we continue to have improvements um, on these WSR 88D radars to expand uh, their, their lifetime. So the three in South Central Texas, again, are KEWX, that's the New Braunfels radar uh, just outside our office. Um, it was installed in 1995. You can see an install picture there with our office in the background. Um, the Laughlin radar was installed in 1994. Um, so the uh, Laughlin Air Force Base maintains that. They, they basically run the radar in cooperation with us. Um, and then the KGRK, or the Fort Hood radar, is out. Uh, on FM 971 uh, in rural Williamson County. While it is in our county warning area, we uh, don't have any responsibility for that radar. So Fort Hood Air Force Base actually maintains it, uh, and the Fort Worth uh, Forecast Office uh, is the one kind of responsible for that partnership. So if that radar goes down, you know, we pass along word. Um, you know, if we notice something going on, we, we work with the Fort Worth office there, but we are not responsible uh, for that radar. 
And, um, you know, the Raiders were designed to last about 20 years. And if you do some quick math, we're already past that in terms of those install dates. So kind of what's being done to prolong the life of, of these radars. And that's actually the Service Life Extension Program. You know, I mentioned yesterday that us meteorologists really like acronyms. So we just call that SLEP. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've been improving um, our radars by replacing a lot of the big important parts of the radar. So in 2018, that was a new signal processor to improve uh, data quality and security of the technology. Uh, in our radars, uh, we uh, put new fuses and wiring in the transmitters in 2019. Uh, the big one, uh, which you saw on the very first slide uh, and on this slide is in 2020, we actually replaced the pedestal. So that's the actual uh, center pedestal that the, the radar dish itself spins on. Uh, we replaced it with a refurbished pedestal, got new wiring, uh, the, the two gears that uh, both uh, control the spin and then the tilt up and down were also replaced. Um, and so that, that required taking the dome off. Um, and it was the first time uh, for KEWX that the dome had been taken off. Wasn't the first time for KDFX, the Laughlin radar, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then we've done other kind of more minor things. So the, the shelters have gotten uh, a new roof, uh, improvements there. The, the shelters are what uh, house a lot of that technology. Um, you know, to do with the radar and then the generators that, um, you know, keep the radar running when there is no commercial power also have been replaced. Um, so again, yeah, it's a multi-year uh, project. It uh, is very expensive and that cost is spread out again between all of those partners that run uh, the uh, basically network of WSR 88Ds across the country. So I mentioned that this was not the first time that the dome had been taken off uh, the DFX radar, and I, I know this was touched on in Paul's basic sky warn yesterday, um, but the KDFX radar back in uh, 2001 met an unfriendly fate with a uh, supercell that had a uh, large hail and uh, surface winds of over 90 miles an hour, and it, it caved in one side of, of the radar itself. Um, and so there's uh, two pictures, one of, you know, the damage after the fact, and then two, them actually pulling off uh, that damaged dome uh, thankfully, the dish was pointed away from uh, where the damage occurred, so it didn't really have a lot of, um, you know, damage to the dish itself. And this was actually the first of now five uh, of our WSR 88Ds since 2001 to uh, have some sort of, of weather damage. Um, you can see that list there from the uh, Radar Operations Center. Um, the Reno, Nevada one was a, a winter storm, actually, that damaged it with a lot of strong winds, a typhoon uh, to one of our radars in Japan. Uh, the San Juan, Puerto Rico uh, was Hurricane Maria and then Lake Charles, um, you know, last year um, with Hurricane Laura there. So, um, you know, it's a pretty good track record. In 25 years, only having uh, five uh, WSR AADs sustain uh, some major damage. That's, that's a testament to how strong that fiberglass dome is and to how strong the, the the technology and, and everything we've built are. So what's next? Um, and that may be this. This is called phased array radar. Um, and this is an example of phased array radar from the uh, large El Reno uh, supercell that produced an EF3 tornado just to the west of uh, Oklahoma City. Um, this technology is still in testing. Uh, it is it is not something um, that, uh, you know, is, is going to be anytime soon. But it, at least, um, you know, it's something that that may be the next step. Uh, and James, I believe they're made of fiberglass. Um, that is that is something I would have to check with our Texon, but I believe they are fiberglass uh, dome sections. So they're different sections that we can actually take out and replace as opposed to replacing that whole dome uh, as one piece. But this new technology, this face array radar, uh, where our current radar gets us a picture every minute or two, this can get us a picture every about 15 to 30 seconds. So uh, you can see a lot more detail of how the hook forms in this. You can see a lot more of the morphology of the storms. Uh, and again, when it comes to, to, to radar data, the quicker we get more accurate data, the, the better, um, so that we can get those warnings out um, to y'all. Okay, so we're gonna really quickly uh, run through some of the basics here. Again, if y'all were here uh, yesterday, um, we've touched on a lot of this. I do wanna touch on it if there's someone new uh, here. 
but also don't want to belabor this because I think everybody kind of want to get to the cool part about talking about the Hondo supercell. So again, how it works, uh, it stands for radio detection and ranging, basically electromagnetic energy uh, and, and microwave pulses are sent out um, from the radar. It finds something to hit, whether that's a raindrop, a hailstone, debris, a central Texas bat from the Bracken Caves, something like that. And that energy is scattered or reflected back to the radar. And then it kind of inputs uh, what it is detected and, and gives us the nice pretty output. Um, so I mentioned this yesterday, but it's interesting. The radar only spends seven seconds every hour transmitting these pulses. Um, that means for the majority of the hour, um, it is actually listening back for the data um, that it needs to give us the nice pretty pictures. So this is a picture of the network of all of the WSR ADDs across the country, uh, across the globe, and then also the, the terminal Doppler radar. So you can see, um, as we'll cover again here in a little bit, we do have some really good coverage across South Central Texas, um, excuse me, in terms of our radars. Um, and even if we have one go down, we do have good coverage uh, in our neck of the woods. Um, as you get into the you know mountain west to the west of the Rockies, um, a lot of that gaps in coverage has to do with the mountains out there and the topography, but really from the Rockies eastward, you, you have some decent coverage. Um, you do have some areas of the country with some gaps, the north and east Texas uh, and other places there. Um, and you can see too that the terminal Doppler radars actually fill in some of those gaps, but they again are located at the larger terminals uh, across the country. So not here at Austin or San Antonio, but uh, DFW, and a love field have them and then two of the uh the houston airports do as well so um, you can see the coverage map there so we talked briefly about this um yesterday but uh the radars have different what we call volume coverage patterns or basically the different elevation angles that they uh, can view um you know the sky with when it's clear air on a day kind of like today, we're really not expecting anything in terms of, of large scale precipitation. They're actually spinning a lot slower. Um, yeah, they are both right now in VCP 35, which is the bottom of this list here. It's what we call our clear air um, VCP. It's spinning slower. It's actually looking a lot more detailed. So things like the bats, bugs, a lot of that ground clutter shows up um, when you have these uh, more clear air VCPs. When we get into a higher stakes, uh, you know, event like a severe weather event, uh, we can ratchet that up um, and get more scans, and we can get them faster. So we usually will uh, turn the radar into VCP 215 or 212, our precipitation uh, VCPs. And you can see there we get a lot more tilts, um, and actually in less time. So the radar starts to spin a lot faster. And then, as we'll cover in the next couple of slides, we have those special types of um, you know, settings that we can uh, install or, or kind of implement to get us even more data uh, that we need. So this is a graphic from yesterday. This again is just kind of reviewing how the radar works. It's a volumetric scanning. So it's giving us a full look at uh, a thunderstorm. So it starts with that 0 0.5 degree or the lowest tilt. Uh, it spins around twice and then tilts up a little bit and gives us that next slice of that thunderstorm. Uh, to build that 3D picture of what's going on, not just at the bottom of the storm, uh, but throughout the column of the storm, to be able to see things like descending hail cores uh, and even uh, some data at the top of the storm, which we can actually use to determine how strong the updraft is. And, and we'll actually touch on that with the Hondo supercell uh, here in, in just a little bit. So again, that's what uh, the different scans look like broken down uh, on a cross section. In a 2D plane, you do have those overlaps at the lowest tilts of the uh, atmosphere. And as you get up in uh, elevation, uh, the uh, uh, tilts actually do have some gaps in them. That's okay. They do uh, tend to, uh, you know, we interpolate that data and it's not really impacting anything. Because again, at the bottom of the storm is really the most important because that's what's going on at the surface. That's what's going on uh, closest to us and what we really need to know. Uh, for the hail, for the tornado type forecasting. Some other things to consider, again, that beam is uh, lifting up and away from the radar, and especially with the curvature of the earth curving down and away from the radar, um, that beam is looking at different parts of the storm. Uh, if we have two storms like this picture illustrates, 
Uh, the closer a storm, we may be looking right at the base of the storm, um, where the further away storm, the one, you know, uh, tens or, or maybe 50 to 100 miles away from the radar, we're looking more at the middle or upper parts of that storm, even from that same 0 0.5 degree base uh, scan. So it's one thing to, to remember as you look at radar data um, that we're looking lower in the storm, the closer you are to the radar, uh, which is why having that dense network is good because uh, we can always use the closest radar um, to you know whatever storms we are interrogating. So this is another kind of look at that. Uh, this is an app that unfortunately is, is going away, but it's a nice 3D picture from the Corpus radar, and you can actually see that slant. So this is um, the picture of the 0 0.5 and all of the other uh, scans, and you can see that slant up and away from the surface of the Earth as the beam goes out towards Houston, and that just is illustrating how the beam rises um, away from the surface of the earth and we're looking at different parts of the storm as you go further and further away uh, from the radar itself. Another thing um, that radars are susceptible to are things like uh, wind farms or uh, even beam blockage from mountains and uh, while we definitely don't have anything as extreme as what we see in the western United States uh, with some of the bigger mountain ranges we do actually have two uh, small mountains uh, just to the northeast and northwest of the KDFX radar um, that do create um, some 0 0.5 degree beam blockages at times. So um, those are il illustrated here. Um, and you would think that West Texas is mostly flat. And these aren't, you know, tall mountains um, at the end of the day, uh, but they're just tall enough. Um, so uh, Robin asked what the range of the radar beam is. Um, we can really get um, some good uh, returns, I think it's when within about 150 miles or so. Once you start getting beyond that, um, the data quality really starts dropping out. You're really looking at the, you know, upper parts of storms. Um, and so um, you start kind of need to be finding a, another radar to use. But we'll actually talk about, you know, kind of those ranges uh, here in just a second as I uh, show a map of, uh, you know, our area and what radar to use. So. So yeah, so beam blockages are a thing uh, in our area as well. So some more things to consider. Uh, the radar beam is not a laser um, and that uh, the beam does spread out as it, as it goes away. And again, just mentioning the curvature of the earth. Um, and even at that 120 mile an hour or 120 mile range, you know, the beam is already over two miles wide at that point. So that's why you're starting to get to those further ranges um, and the, the data quality does start dropping off. So not sure if you're going to be able to hear this but we're going to try um, but this is a scene from a famous movie which you may recognize <laughs> and right here he goes the cone of silence and so this i referenced this the other day and and there's our two you know movie heroes there um, so that famous line in Twister actually is inaccurate. The cone of silence doesn't have anything to do with tornadoes, uh, but what it does have something to do with is that area above radars that they can't see because they can't tilt totally vertical. Um, there's actually an area um, illustrated again here, um, you know, from this nice plane view where um, the radar is basically blind. Um, and so that is the true cone of silence there as opposed to the, the line from, from Twister there. But hey, all of us weather weenies have seen that movie enough times that we could probably quote it uh, all to each other. So we covered this yesterday, uh, but again, uh, just to kind of bring home how good we have it here in South Central Texas in terms of, of radar coverage, you know, below 10,000 feet, really all of South Central Texas uh, does have that type of coverage from our three area radars. Uh, Laredo, uh, unfortunately, does not, and so that presents a challenge for the Corpus office and the forecasters down there. Um, as we start to, uh, you know, look a little bit lower, coverage does start to drop out below 6,000 feet for parts of the hill country and parts of the coastal plains, while, uh, you know, the best coverage below about 4,000 feet, um, again, is really centered around those urban areas, which is why typically, you know, our WSR 88D radars are centered around urban centers it's to get the best quality data closest to where the population is sitting. So, you know, you see right all the way down uh, the I-35 corridor is good. And then for most of the big cities uh, out even in the Rio Grande Plains, 
from Del Rio to Eagle Pass to Uvalde, we have that coverage below 4,000 feet. So again, just because your area is not shaded here does not mean we don't have good coverage, does not mean you know, we can't see some certain weather feature. It's just the best coverage um, is you know, lower and closer to the radar. So this is that graphic that I was mentioning. I teased yesterday and just mentioned here answering Robin's question. Um, because we have those three radars, um, this is an image that basically presents which radar is closest to uh, the various counties in our in our neck of the woods. So uh, if all three radars are running like they are most of the time, this is the one that I would say you know you should probably look at first if you're looking uh, you know at weather in your neck of the woods. So you know around here, New Braunfels, including the San Antonio area, using KEWX, the New Braunfels radar. If you're up in Austin or parts of the Northern Hill Country, it's more Granger because Granger is closer to y'all. And then uh, if you are out west, um, then KDFX is closest. So this is actually going to come into play here in uh, a little bit when we talk about the Hondo supercell. But if you notice from Kerrville south to Hondo, um, really those row of counties are equidistant between uh, KDFX and KEWX. So really it's nickel difference which one you use. They're about halfway between uh, the two radars there. So one of the cool things that we can do with our radars, in addition to sales and Merle, which we talked about yesterday and we'll talk about here in just a second, is we can actually tell the radar, hey, all these extra really high scans up in the atmosphere, we don't need them if, um, if there's really nothing there. So we can turn something on called ABSET, yet another uh, acronym. But essentially, at the end of the day, what it does is it tells the radar, hey, if you're looking there and there's no returns, if, if there's nothing that you're spying on, just stop scanning them. You know, we don't need that because it's clear air and that actually shortens the time then uh, between, uh, you know, the data that, that we get to see. So it cuts off um, some of that uh, completion time. As we covered yesterday, a sales is something that has been around and actually been improved several times, uh, which allows us to see that lowest cut, that 0 0.5 degree cut, up to three times as often as the radar tilts up and looks at the rest of the elevation scan. So, you know, that's important again uh, to see things like uh, tornado formation and rotations there, you know, hail cores at the bottom, stuff like that. So we can ratchet that up um, to sales three, and it, it really gets us now um, a view uh, every couple of seconds, maybe, you know, every minute and a half or so of that 0 0.5 degree scan, um, which is needed in those times. And then Merle uh, is just an example of getting more views of the middle of the storm. Um, as opposed to just the base of the storm, seeing things like descending hill cores, uh, a mesocyclone forming in a supercell per se. So we don't use this one as often in our neck of the woods. We use sails, I would say, for almost every severe weather event. Merle, we use a lot more rarely, but it's there as a tool uh, in our toolkit at least. So, and this is actually an example of Merle. So it's gonna show you those first four uh, scans. So essentially what to look at here is just notice that those first four scans are updating basically twice as often uh, as the rest are. So that is giving you those four lowest cuts in the atmosphere basically twice as often as those higher uh, elevation angles uh, looking at the higher parts of the storm. So, you know, again, the higher parts are beneficial to see what's going on, but really it's that lowest parts of the storm that we can kind of see where's the heavy rainfall, where's the potential for hail or any type of, of rotation. There's a lot of other cool things um, that the radar can see, um, especially uh, when you have inversions going on in the atmosphere. Uh, basically, uh, a layer of warm air that we talked about during the advanced talk yesterday can actually bend uh, the radar uh, beam down to the surface of the earth. And then we can play cop basically from our office and see uh, people speeding down along I-35. So that's one thing. Um, it can see smoke from large wildfires like the uh, Bashaw Complex fire, for example. And then uh, here's another example of all the bats that it can see across South Central Texas, um, the Bracken Cave, the ones in Uvalde County, um, and the ones in the, the Hill Country as well. So lots of cool things uh, that the radar can see. So really briefly, I wanted to kind of run through, okay, cool, so that's a history of the radar. Now, where can I find radar data? Where can I use it? Where can, can I find both the data itself and ways to view it? So the first is, is through the Weather Service. We have recently uh, upgraded our, uh, you know, uh, radar websites um, to new technology, uh, thanks to flash going away. 
And uh, while it was a bit clunky at the beginning, we'll totally admit that uh, things have slowly improved over time. Um, so you can now view both single radar products from you know, KDFX or KEWX or multi-radar, multi-sensor, which stitches together all of the national radars uh, on, on our weather page. And then we have the little images as well um, that uh, we still post on our web page uh, that kind of show just about the last half hour to hour of, of radar images as well. So that's kind of the first source, but there's actually a lot of sources. Again, all this data comes from us, but whether it's packaged from the College of DuPage and their weather site, um, you know, private weather sites like Weather Nerds, um, UCAR's weather site, there's a lot of places online that you can view uh, either individual radar data or multi-radar, multi-sensor, you know, that kind of mosaic picture all stitched together. And it's not just online either. Um, obviously, there are a bunch of smartphone apps out there. This is probably one of the most common questions that Paul or I get uh, anytime we do a Skywarn talk. Um, and um, which one's best? It, it's honestly whatever you need there. Um, so radar scope does certain things that my radar might not. Or, you know, again, even our radar.weather.gov is, um, you know, one of the, uh, the options there. So lots of different things uh, and different options there. Some free, some paid. It, it again, is, is all kind of what you need that radar data for. And at the end of the day, it's all the same data coming from our radars. And then there's options on the computer too. So Gibson Ridge is the kind of nice fancy uh, piece of, uh, of PC uh, radar uh, software that's out there. Um, this is actually an example up from the Hondo Supercell, which we'll talk about here uh, in a little bit. Um, this is a little bit more in the pricey range, but um, for the, the true weather weenies out there that, that have that money, uh, they have a level two and a level three product. Um, and we'll talk about what that actually means uh, here in a couple of slides, the differences between level two and level three. But yeah, they do have those two different uh, products. And I think there's even more out there, uh, GR Earth or, or whatever that has become um, as well. So this allows you to do a lot more um, 2D scanning or 2D slices, uh, 3D modeling of this, uh, looking uh, at different radar products, uh, which we'll cover um, today. A lot of the screenshots uh, when we talk about the Hondo Supercell are all from uh, Gibson Ridge software. And then what about past radar data? Well, it's actually all out there and all for free. Um, let's see, get to training as well. Yeah, um, we'll definitely, uh, Robin, actually speak to how meteorologists are trained um, in, in, uh, in radar data, actually, as we go into the Hondo Supercell stuff. But yeah, there's all of this radar data is, um, is there for the taking, kind of, and it can all be easily dropped into a program like Gibson Ridge um, or some of the free tools um, out there from the National Climate Data Center, um, from NCEI or, or from uh, what's called the uh, Weather and Climate Toolkit. If you just Google these things, it basically is all out there on either Amazon or through NCEI to be pulled. So this is you know, an archived image uh, from the uh, EF5 Gerald Tornado. And I was able to go online, find that data, plop it right into Gibson Ridge. And there I was looking at the radar data that we had um, from 1997. So it's all out there for the taking for you to look at uh, not just storms here in our neck of the woods, but past storms, you know, say the, uh, you know, uh, EF3, uh, you know, tornado up there in El Reno or the EF5 uh, more tornado in Oklahoma. You know, you can pick and choose on either of these uh, platforms to find that data. So really briefly, uh, wanting to talk before we go into a uh, fairly quick review of the uh, base uh, products and the dual pole products, I do want to cover what these different levels mean. A lot of the times you may you know, find online, you may hear, well, it's GR level two or GR level three. And what, what does that mean? Well, the level one products from the radar are basically the raw products that are not archived. And this is the very truest raw data coming back to the radar. So the power, the phase, the polarization, basically the data that the radar uses to process to make that pretty picture. That's the level one data. We don't really look at it. It's just the data coming back into the radar. The first pass through um, the radar da data equi acquisition unit uh, produces the level two data. And this is the high resolution data. And it's the core data um, that we use you know, to make warnings, to, to observe the weather. And that's a reflectivity, velocity, and spectrum width, which we'll all talk about. And then three of the uh, dual pole products, correlation coefficient, 
uh, ZDR and Phi. And then Phi uh, and all of these other ones feed into what are called level three products, which is everything else um, basically that comes out of the radar product generator. So this is different, um, uh, different uh, algorithms like uh, tornado vortex signatures, the composite reflectivity, precipitation products, echo tops, the list goes on and on and on with those level three products. Um, so yeah, so that's the difference there. So kind of the truest data is that level two, that's why we use it a lot. So that's why, you know, all of our PCs here at the office have GR level two on them. Um, and then a lot of the level three products are kind of the extras, the bonus stuff that you get at the end of the day. Okay, so we're gonna really quickly run through all of the product types real quick. And uh, again, I'm gonna fairly quickly speed through all of these as uh, most folks um, who may be around now were on the call yesterday for the advanced talk and have seen these. Um, but the first of these and the most common one that most people see and use is the base reflectivity. Um, basically, uh, that 0 0.5 degree scans a raw reflectivity um, which is just the how much power you know the target is um, sending back to the radar. So you know uh, this is a great example that not all the targets have to be meteorological. They can be the bats, uh, you know, coming out along the circulation of Hurricane Harvey, um, or they can be uh, you know birds or dust or these other things. So that's kind of the most common one that we all get to use. Um, composite reflectivity takes that the next step, where base reflectivity just looks at one scan. Um, whether that be the 0 0.5 degree or one of the higher tilts. Composite reflectivity is a derived product that looks at the whole uh, column of reflectivity and then displays the highest uh, value that it finds. So in this case, that is some hail in the middle of the storm. And so uh, the composite reflectivity is going to return that highest value. So why, do, why is that important to us at the end of the day to, to forecast? Well, looking at this picture, you know, on the left, you see the 0 0.5 degree base reflectivity and the composite reflectivity on the right. And if you were looking at that left image, you would be looking at that and saying, well, you know, the, the storms to the west of the DFW area, they're the stronger ones. They're the ones that, you know, we may need to, to worry about. Those other two, while there is some kind of hook shape to them, you know, they don't look that bad. Well, if you look at composite reflectivity, they really start to pop out, especially that storm in the middle that's because they have that elevated hail core, that elevated updraft that is forcing a lot of that reflectivity upwards. And so uh, we use this composite reflectivity to really start to pinpoint the strongest storms uh, in, in our neck of the woods. So you do lose some of that uh, high uh, resolution features like low level hooks um, and stuff like that when you start to use composite reflectivity. But if you just want a quick picture of which storm is strongest, uh, composite reflectivity very much works. And then you can go back to those base reflectivities um, to really do a lot of the interrogation of the storm itself. So velocity is the measure of the radial velocity. Um, really what you're looking at is winds going to the radar and the greens and going away from the radar and the reds. And whenever those uh, start to pair up, that is uh, basically the radar painting the picture of a potential circulation. So uh, we saw this yesterday with the Leander tornado uh, in 2018. Uh, when you have the greens and the reds right next to each other, pixel to pixel, um, that is the radar seeing uh, rotation and, and likely a uh, either either mesocyclone, a, a tightening uh, rotation, or a potential tornado there. So that's what we use velocity for. Uh, we covered this yesterday, um, but something that we really like um, to hit on is this potential uh, for side lobe contamination, basically erroneous uh, velocity data that looks at the end of the day like a rotation. You know, we have gotten, um, you know, people pointing this out to us at the end of the day, and, and it's just erroneous data. So what happens is the radar beam, you know, is again, not a laser. So kind of parts of the uh, radar beam itself hit some of the larger hail and the tops and the sides of the storm. And that radar data gets corrupted and basically sends back some false echoes. So um, we use this example from uh, April 6th yesterday. Um, and, but we have created this really great graphic that we have shared a couple of times on social media of what to look for, um, you know, for the side lobe contamination. So is uh, that potential rotation, is that, is that kind of velocity signature in an area of little to no reflectivity? Um, if it is, that's really an unrealistic area for a tornado to, to form. 
is spectrum width very noisy? So we'll talk about spectrum width again. If it is, um, that again is a sign that that may be silo contamination. Um, is there a velocity signature pregnant, uh, present? Um, so is that uh, you know con, uh, continuous aloft? Um, and if, if those aren't true, well then again, maybe a silo contamination and then is correlation coefficient very noisy. So you can kind of go down this checklist and anytime we see potential side lobe contamination out there, we're likely going to be sharing this graphic to remind the public that, hey, you know, we kind of, we know what we're looking for. Um, you know, this kind of goes back to your question, Robin, of, of we've been trained to see these type of erroneous data and, and to know, you know, in this case, the, the magenta is the true um, circulation that had a tornado warning on it where the uh, circulation near Watson uh, was very much the side lobe contaminated. Um, you know, fake rotation or, or basically not real rotation at the end of the day. Here's another example, uh, actually from this year, this is back in, in March. Um, and uh, on the left uh, side here, uh, you can see a bunch of erroneous data uh, just to the, to the north of Liberty Hill and the orange circles. Um, and we actually had a lot of questions, including uh, people that is, by the way, you know, a, a totally fake Twitter picture and name and tag. Don't go look that up. I made that up, but that is a real tweet uh, that we got, um, basically. Um, and it's because people were seeing this velocity and thinking that we needed to issue a tornado warning. Just because something has a hook, just because uh, something kind of looks bad does not necessarily mean that there's a tornado there. So we saw the high spectrum width. We saw some of those checklist things, how the supposed rotation was out well ahead of the storm in an unrealistic location. And we had a severe thunderstorm warning out on it, but we did not have that tornado warning. Now, later on, as that storm did move in to Williamson County, the rotation tightened up. You can see in the bottom uh, right there now in the red circle, actually a really good tight rotation. And we did have a tornado warning out for it uh, at that point. Um, so we did warn on it once that was a true rotation uh, at the end of the day. Okay, so storm relative velocity is something that we use a lot uh, in tornado forecasting, uh, basically it is uh, subtracting the storm motion away from that overall velocity. So in essence, we're, we're putting a pause on the storm and saying, hey, don't move. I want to see if there's real rotation inside you. Um, and, and so we can subtract that away with either our AWIP systems or GR level two. Um, it is always important to know uh, where the radar is located. Um, and hopefully it's not as close as this example a GIF here. This was actually back in um, the Halloween event of 2015, where we had uh, a circulation basically go right around the edge of the cone of silence of our New Braunfels radar. I was working that morning. Um, we were on the phone with our corpus office saying, hey, we may need to shelter because this tornado uh, may be coming at our office. You know, you may need to take over our warning responsibilities. Thankfully, it kind of moved to the north and then obviously off to the north and east. Um, it was tornado warned the whole time, uh, but we stayed, uh, you know, the warning forecasters and we were watching it very closely uh, to see if it was going to come come at the office or not. And there's actually a picture that I didn't include here of some of the damage that Paul took on a survey. You can actually see KEWX in the background of that photo. So spectrum width I had mentioned uh, is essentially the uh, measure of turbulence in the atmosphere. Um, so again, if the radar is seeing um, some fake velocity data in those side lobe contamination moments, um, the uh, radar is going to see that it's very turbulent air. Well, yes, there's a circulation for a tornado, but a lot of the times it's a kind of stable circulation, so you actually get lower um, spectrum width for a, a good formed tornado. Um, but there are other times when that rotation is forming or uh, along boundaries of convergence, like out ahead of a squall line, um, that you can actually get higher spectrum width as you get that more turbulent air. So briefly running through the dual polarization products, uh, the trio of products there, uh, again, they really help uh, distinguish the actual target that we're looking at. You know, is this a rain uh, drop versus a hailstone versus a bat versus a piece of tornado debris? Uh, it paints that kind of two-dimensional picture of that horizontal and vertical slice of that target that we're seeing. And, and again, this has been... Um, you know, really life-changing technology for us as meteorologists uh, over the last 10 years and has really improved our forecasting of things like hail and tornadoes. 
So differential reflectivity or ZDR uh, looks at basically the difference in that profile. Is it more is it more a vertical target like something like an ice crystal might be? Is it something like a horizontal target like a, a raindrop? You know, might be because as you get the friction of the atmosphere, it's that raindrop is not coming down as a perfect sphere, but actually is more of an oval shape. Um, or is it a, a tumbling hailstone that may actually come across almost like a sphere as it spins in that very strong updraft? So um, that's what we use ZDR for. A KDP, or specific differential phase, may be something you haven't really heard a lot about. It's, it's there in radar scope, it's there in Gibson Ridge, but it really helps us uh, you know, look at the liquid water content of what the beam is hitting. So is something uh, very liquidy? <laughs> And, and is it heavy rainfall or light rain, or is it something uh, more of a lower liquid content? And you know, in those instances, maybe it's a lot of large hail. So we can use a uh, specific differential phase, KDP, to, to see where the heavy rain shafts are, to see if the targets are, again, more liquid-based or are they you know, kind of uh, you know, a little bit less and, and maybe more, more hail-based kind of thing. And then correlation coefficient, um, one of the probably most commonly used dual pole products uh, is, is measuring how much that horizontal and that vertical uh, pulse change over time. So if you have non-meteorological targets like bats, like birds, um, like tornado debris, there's going to be a lot of changing between scans of, of what the radar is seeing because it's a bunch of random motion, a bunch of trees, you know, plywood, whatever in the air, a bunch uh, of bats in the sky, you know, with their flapping wings, et cetera. That's a lower correlation coefficient. Um, it's a lot more uniform when you start getting things like hail um, or even more uniform when we have lots of snow or raindrops. And so you get that kind of spectrum of correlation coefficient from very low to kind of in the middle of the road to high correlation coefficient. So that's one of the ways that we actually can differentiate between the bats uh, and rainfall uh, here in South Central Texas, um, you know, when they're both on radar uh, right next to each other is we can look at correlation coefficient. The bats will be a lower correlation coefficient while the, um, the rainfall or the precipitation will be a higher correlation coefficient. So one of the things uh, that we can use all of these tools for uh, is uh, tornado debris signatures. We'll also talk about three body scatter spikes as we hop in uh, to talking about the Hondo supercell. But again, to uh, you know start to look at these different dual pole variables and base variables, they all need to be present at the same time for something to be true here. So if you're looking for that kind of high uh, reflectivity, that kind of hook shape, uh, coincident with a good velocity signature that's gate to gate, um, very low ZDR and very low CC. And if those all four line up, then we do think that that's a good uh, indicator of, of debris in the atmosphere being lofted up there by really the only thing that can get it into the upper reaches of the storm which is a tornado at the surface. So we can call a tornadic supercell radar confirmed if we do have a, a, a tornado debris signature present uh, you know, in, in that storm. Okay, so looking at kind of the last product before we really uh, hop in uh, to looking at the Hondo supercell uh, is echo tops. And this is basically the height uh, of the, the top of the precipitation basically. So. The higher the storm, the stronger the updraft, because you've got to have a lot of fast moving upward air to get the, uh, you know, the, the precipitation lofted that high in the atmosphere. So it is better with storms uh, further away from the radar, because again, uh, you know, you can only tilt up to that 19 uh, degree and a half degree scan. So it's kind of hard to see the top of a storm sitting right over the radar. Um, and basically uh, enhanced echo tops, which is another product out there actually uses two different scans uh, to interpolate that height. So Equitops is being included here because we actually get a fair amount of questions about it. And then again, it's another indicator of some really, really strong updrafts out there. Um, let's see. Um, Doug, I will get to your question here in just a second about what to look at on GR um, when we hop into the Hondo Supercell, which is actually right about now. So uh, here, are, here are two different examples of four panels. Um, and actually, Doug, that was a great uh, question uh, to ask. Um, so what I would likely do uh, if I was looking at uh, four different scans in warning operations for me as a meteorologist is I would use what's in the top right, which is reflectivity, uh, base velocity, storm relative velocity, and correlation coefficient. 
Um, and then if I needed to, I would swap out that correlation coefficient with the other variables. Because for me, looking at those four is really going to inform me if there's hail there, if you know there is a potential tornado debris signature there, there. And then looking at other things like VIL or like um, you know the estimated uh, hail size or something like that, all of those products fall out of the base products. So looking at those four uh, core products are, are what I typically do. The other four panel is uh, the estimated hail size, uh, ZDR, KDP, and spectrum width. Um, so, I mean, if I had an eight panel, these would probably be the eight products that I had up, but that top right panel is, is kind of my suggestion there. And Robin, I haven't forgot about your training question. I'm actually gonna talk about that in two slides here, but what we're gonna do uh, is apply all of this radar knowledge that we've talked about thus far in the last uh, you know, 45 minutes or so to the last 15 minutes of the talk and talk about our record 6.4 inch hailstone storm uh, that impacted Hondo. And we're gonna step through the life of that storm uh, and look at different radar products while we do. So first off the environment. So this goes back to both um, uh, the, uh, yeah. So I'll go back real quick, Doug, thanks for the question. So uh, I would do reflectivity, uh, ba uh, base velocity, uh, storm relative velocity and correlation coefficient are the four that I would focus on. And then kind of secondarily, uh, NGR, the uh, largest uh, hail estimates or maximum expected hail size, uh, ZDR, KDP, and spectrum width are the kind of eight that I would focus on. Okay, so going back to the environment for this event uh, back in April, um, and we touched on kind of the ingredients that we need uh, in both uh, Skywarn talks yesterday, and they were all in place for this. I mean, we had dew points uh, near 70 um, out along the Rio Grande. Uh, we had uh, from this sounding that we released early, um, a couple hours early, a special sounding. We had a good uh, 2,500 to almost 3,000 Cape. So there's your instability, uh, very good instability. We did have a little bit of a capping inversion, which is actually good in this case because it kind of puts a, a brief lid on the environment before things blow up. And then uh, shear, we had plenty of that, 60 to 70 knots of shear. Uh, and then our lift was actually uh, kind of both topographical and atmospheric. So we had a nice big trough of low pressure across the Four Corners region and West Texas. And that's also putting a bunch of air over uh, the Cienaris del Burro uh, Mountains uh, which are just to our west, uh, west of Del Rio. And so you have that orographic lifting, the air going up and over the mountains um, to create um, that lift. So all of the ingredients for big storms was in place uh, for this event. So um, Robin had asked about the training that we get as, as forecasters. So I'm working with Mac again tonight and Mac is actually one of our newest forecasters. And he recently, a couple months ago, completed what we call our radar applications course. That's the course that every new meteorologist in the National Weather Service goes through. And it's a it's a very extensive course in all of these topics that we've covered here and are going to cover in just this little over an hour. So we have a lot of training that they sit and watch, that we sit and watch. We have several different, both in our office and in Norman or virtually this year in, in the COVID era, um, simulations that we go through that puts the person in the hot seat gives them real data to look at and real warnings to issue um, in their kind of simulated environment. So we have a lot of decision aids and cheat sheets uh, that we can still keep around as reference, um, but that is an extensive thing, uh, training regiment that we go through, again, months of, of pre-training and then at least a week of intensive uh, in-person training before our forecaster in the weather service is cut loose um, to, to issue warnings. So we are all certified to issue warnings. There are some of us, you know, I know Robin asked, are there some better than others? I think there are, you know, people who thrive on the warning forecasting who are really good at it while others may do better with social media or the forecasting or, or talking to emergency managers. Um, but we are all certified. We can all do it if, if needed. And we can, we all have this training. So there's a lot of this decision aids that go into what we're looking at that kind of stays in the back of our minds as we start to look at the radar. So hopping into the event, this is the beginning. So you can already see a couple of supercells already forming across the mountains to the west of Del Rio. Uh, we had one that was moving due north. 
um, that ha was our first warning of the day. And then our second one is our lead supercell that we're gonna be talking a lot about. Um, in both cases, just from this pure reflectivity data, you can see three body scatter spikes, the little mohawks, those spikes at the uh, you know, tail end of the storms here um, as they go to the north and as they pass over Del Rio. We had two to three inch hail out of this very initial uh, supercell here um, already. So we did not have a bunch of downtime. Um, it was it was already uh, an active day right from the get-go, right from storm development uh, over Mexico. So here's an example of some of those three body scatter spikes. Again, what's caused, uh, what causes these uh, is the radar beam going out from the radar, hitting that hail core, um, the jagged edges of that hail, forcing that radar beam to the surface of the earth, back to the, the hail, and then back to the radar. The radar doesn't know what to do with that extra trip. It, it thinks that it should have just gone to the target and back where it went to this extra trip down to the surface of the earth. Well, uh, it, it adds that to the back of the storm, adds that mohawk. Um, and then because it's kind of data that, that puzzles the radar, it comes up as low correlation coefficient. So um, you'll see the spike in reflectivity and that spike will um, be the dark blue, which is the low uh, correlation coefficient. And here are just two examples, again, from early on, from that northern supercell and then from the one approaching del rio if you were to go back and pull the data for this entire event um, like i did for this presentation i think i counted something like seven or eight different times that there were extensive hail spikes out of some of these storms so um, it would have been a lot to screenshot them all but again it's just an indicator for us as the forecaster without looking at any other product or even like the max expected hail size that hey there's a good hail core on that storm also, you know, not every hook produces a tornado. So um, here is that first lead supercell as it's now between Del Rio and Brackettville, uh, right over Pinto. Um, and, you know, you kind of see that hook. If you were looking at that, you'd be like, oh my gosh, there's gotta be like a strong tornado there, right? Well, if you look at the velocity data, you do have inbounds and outbounds, but they're kind of in the wrong space. You would want them right next to each other, kind of right in the crux of that hook near Pinto. And you see that they're not really there. So what this is, is actually what's called the rear flank downdraft or a bunch of air, you know, being forced down and out of the storm um, and out ahead of it. So this is why we say that supercells have all the different types of, um, you know, potential hazards. It's not just, you know, tornadoes or not just large hail. Um, this supercell and, and once it combined with the one behind it, as it got into Hondo, had a hundred plus mile an hour rear flank downdraft. Yes, it did end up producing a tornado, and we'll talk about that, but just straight line winds, it had a 100 mile an hour wind driven hail um, out of it. So not every hook produces a, a, a tornado um, here like this case. And again, right where that rear flank downdraft is, you still get that very strong updraft, and we were still getting you know, two inch hail uh, just to the west of Brackettville out of this storm as it continued its way westward, or eastward, excuse me. So that lead supercell actually started to slow down as it moved across Uvalde County and a second supercell formed behind it uh, right over Brackettville. And as these went from Uvalde to Medina County, they actually combined into one another. Um, and uh, hopefully no one asks in the chat uh, how often this happens. This is one thing that I have wanted to research um, and dig into since, um, since this event. I don't know how often two supercells will combine like this uh, and it does appear like the combination as it moved uh, into Medina County is, is what really strengthened the updraft to not only produce uh, the tornado, but also uh, the very large hail. So it was it was kind of a crazy thing to watch that second supercell catch up and produce uh, the large supercell over Hondo. So the first tornado warning uh, happened basically right as the storm uh, crossed into uh, Medina County. We'll see if the animation on the left will play, there it goes. Um, and as you can see from the still on the right, you actually finally did get, um, while not perfect gate to gate or pixel to picture, pixel to pixel, excuse me, um, velocity data, that rotation did start to wrap up. And, and we did not get a confirmed tornado out here uh, north of Sabinal uh, near Dehanus. Uh, that, that happened closer uh, to Hondo later on in the life of the storm. Um, but at least the first good rotation did occur right here. Now you may be looking at this correlation coefficient and being like, Aaron, that's low CC. That's, that's got to be a TDS, right? Well, that's actually 
um, a bunch of the bugs and the, the birds and dust being sucked in to that updraft in the what we call inflow region of the um, of the supercell. So uh, there was some vertical continuity to it, but if you watch the animation here, all of this blue out ahead of it is all of that uh, dust and bugs and birds being sucked into the supercell rather than it being kind of internal to the storm where we would think that TDS would form. So I mentioned early on in the presentation uh, that this area is really equidistant between both radars, between KDFX, um, which you can view on the top, and KEWX, which you can view on the bottom. And you can see basically the same radar representation uh, from both. Uh, you know, it was looking about 5,000 feet up in the, in the storm, kind of here in between the two, um, but you get decent velocity signatures, you get decent uh, reflectivity signatures from both radars at this point. The other thing, and this was a thing uh, that we did notice a little bit in the moment, uh, but definitely in the post analysis of the storm, um, is this is right as it was over Hondo, basically right as it was producing uh, the record hailstone, um, that we had a good signature of a very, very strong updraft, and that was what we call a bounded weak echo region or B weird. And so that is the updraft being so strong that it actually creates an area of low reflectivity because there is so much air moving up into the storm that it actually counteracts gravity. That, you know, the hail, the rain that's trying to fall, it can't because that updraft is so, so strong going upwards um, uh, that we get what we call a bounded weak echo region. So you can see that in the in the uh, 2D cross-section view here, the low reflectivity where the arrow is. And you can even see that, uh, I believe this is the like three or four degree slice. You have a bunch of high reflectivity and then right over Hondo, that little hole of the greens there of that lower reflectivity. So that is a, a definite signature that this is a very healthy supercell with a very, very strong updraft. And you can see even as we uh, start to talk about the hail itself, all the high reflectivity out ahead of, this, of the storm uh, aloft. And so um, this storm was not just producing right underneath it this large hail, but it was likely chunking out these, these large hailstones well above, uh, well in front of the storm at least. So this white dot is right where um, the large hailstone was observed. And again, you can kind of look at these different images from the 0 0.5 degree scan uh, the 5.1 degree scan, seeing the upper parts of the storm, and then that maximum expected hail size, again, all from about the same time, where that large hailstone fell, there wasn't much reflectivity, at least at the surface. There was a loft, though, so that is that large hail core uh, lofting very high DBZ, you know, 40,000 feet in the atmosphere. So this is a very, very healthy storm, a very healthy uh, updraft there. And again, even this uh, approximation of 4.29 inches was the largest uh, approximation that GR was spitting out. Again, it was two inches too small, basically. You know, 6.41 inches was the uh, highest uh, that we, we got out of it. So um, the, the hail was being lofted and maintained well above the freezing level um, to produce that large, large hailstone, which we ended up getting several different, I think we ended up getting four different pictures of stones uh, you know, larger than about five and a half inches. Uh, we were only able to verify, though, the one uh, stone that has officially become the record. Okay, so two other things that we look at, again, echo tops. Um, we were getting estimates of about 60,000 feet for the top of the storm. So yet again, very strong updraft, very, very tall storm. And then uh, further proof of that was looking at the velocity and what we call storm top divergence. So that strong updraft has to hit the layer of the atmosphere and eventually spread out, right? Hit the tropopause between the stratosphere and the troposphere, spread out in all directions. And uh, when we have a very strong storm top divergence, we know that the updraft is strong. This one had over 240 knots from both radars, from both KEWX and uh, KDFX. And uh, according to at least one of the trainers at WDTD, that was some of the strongest storm top divergence he had ever seen um, on this supercell. So yet again, um, all evidence of, of a storm that's going to produce that large, large hail. So here's the uh, confirmed tornado that we, we got. Again, um, let me see if I can be as fancy as Paul here and draw. But again, you have um, where the black arrow is, that very strong 
rear flank downdraft wrapping, wrapping around um, the supercell here. And so even without that tornado, you're still getting 90 to 110 mile an hour winds driving, you know, three, four, five inch hailstones, um, you know, in and around the Hondo area. But we do start to get a fairly decent consistent rotation right here, which is where we were able to uh, verify uh, some damage for an EF1 tornado of about 110 mile an hour winds uh, there at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, so we did still get a, a tornado out of and then the storm actually impacted all three of our large metro areas. So as it moved from Hondo into San Antonio, uh, the initial circulation weakened, and then it actually turned to the Northeast, rode I-35 up and finally weakened over Austin. Those additional uh, tornado warnings over Comal County never uh, came to fruition. We never uh, got anything uh, confirmed out of that other than some wind damage. But even then you can see the, the green polygon, that flash flood warning, over San Antonio. Now we all know if you are a local that flash flooding uh, is something that's not only uh, a big story here in South Central Texas, but it, you know, San Antonio is easy to flood. So how do we forecast that? Well, the last uh, six slides that I've got here to wrap us up fairly quick are all on uh, the hydrologic products that we use. So we can use the radars to look at one hour, three hour or storm total precipitation. Um, this actually comes from both the legacy side and the dual pole side. So we actually get two calculations for each of these uh, variables. Uh, the legacy is just based off the power the, of the reflectivity, basically how strong the reflectivity is. The dual pole though, takes into account that cross section and looks at, is this snow, is this hail, is this heavy rainfall and how heavy is it using things like KDP um, to make a, a different uh, estimation as well. Let's see. So the first thing is with that dual pole classification, it is able to put together that um, you know horizontal and vertical uh, cross section and, and make an estimation of what that hydrometeor actually is. You know, is it rain? Is it snow? Is it hail or even a large hail? Um, and sometimes you know it, it's not a hundred percent accurate. If there are multiple things falling in a, in a you know rain shaft, if it's small hail and rain, the radar is going to try to guess which one is occurring more often. So this isn't 100% accurate, but it does give a nice first guess to us, the forecaster, is what's falling. So this is an archive from Radar Scope uh, from the storm, uh, and you can see both the lead storm here as it's entering uh, Bear County and the follow-up storm has a bunch of reds and yellows, and that again is the hail and the large hail in addition to the dark greens, which are heavy rainfall. So this hydrometeor classification product is pretty cool um, that it's giving you that kind of first guess of what's falling uh, out of the storm. And then this is just an animation here on the left of one hour precipitation and storm total precipitation for this event. Um, we uh, did get some pretty heavy rainfall and again, a lot of uh, you know flooding on the Northwest side of San Antonio here. Uh, for this event, uh, flooding wasn't our main concern because these storms are moving fairly quickly, um, but uh, still just wanted to show that to you and show these different products that we use. And then to wrap up, I did want to talk about multi-radar, multi-sensor, uh, or MRMS. Um, and this is really a cool mosaic that uh, stitches together multiple radars. So this isn't a local example. This is an example out of Kansas City. Uh, but on the left, that MRMS picture is taking four different radars in. Uh, and it fills in the gaps. It's actually taking in model data and satellite data as well to help uh, kind of assimilate everything together in a cohesive picture. And it gives us a nice broader picture uh, compared to at times the, uh, the single radar pick. And you can notice the single radar gives a lot better resolution. You know, we're not going to be issuing tornado warnings off of multi-radar, multi-sensor, um, but it does give that more cohesive picture. You can view multi-radar, multi-sensor products online. Uh, this link here is to the MRMS viewer from NSSL. Um, we get all of this into our systems. Uh, to my knowledge right now, there's not a software out there that you can install on your phone or on your computer that, that views MRMS data. But again, it's, it's viewable online and we have access to it here uh, in the office. And there's a treasure trove of products here from uh, Echo Tops to uh, different rotation and lightning pictures to some of the flash or flash flooding products that I'm going to show on the next slide 
uh, that we often use here in our, uh, our CWA. So these are those five products. I'm not gonna really explain what they each mean uh, in depth, but these are the key products that we use uh, when there is a lot of uh, flash flooding going on. Basically these top two are able to measure uh, the amount of runoff or stream flow in both uh, area creeks and streams uh, and in the overland flow. So, you know, something like San Antonio here uh, where we had that flooding going on, that flash flood warning, uh, it's estimating that there's a lot of runoff going on. So we can see that in those two products. Uh, it can also estimate using models uh, and other data, the soil saturation due to the rain. And then things like return period, how often do we get this amount of rainfall or how does it compare to the flash flood guidance that our RFCs are, uh, are putting out? You know, So all of these products fall out of that multi-radar, multi-sensor because it takes all of the radar data from KDFX, from KEWX, puts it in, combines it with model data, combines it with other computing power and spits out these variables that we can then use uh, to issue flash flood warnings. And so to wrap up, uh, this is actually another event that I worked now rewinding back to 2018 and it was flooding along uh, the Nueces River um, out in Uvalde County. Uh, and this happened early in the morning. And this is going to show as it slowly progresses through uh, the reflectivity in the top right, that storm total rainfall, and then two of those flash variables on the left. And as you can see, these variables start to increase in value. And we ended up issuing uh, flash flood warnings uh, in the tweet on the bottom right. You can see what it looks like on a normal day versus what it looked like on this morning in terms of the amount of rainfall uh, that fell, which was estimated as much as four to potentially close to eight inches of rain. We did have some water rescues that went on uh, at one campground along the Noasis River, but another campground actually got our WIA alerts on the flash flood warning and was able to uh, evacuate their campers and, and didn't require any rescuing there. So I'm a little bit over, six minutes over, um, but this is my favorite picture from that Hondo Supercell with the Bracken Bat Cave uh, bats coming out right ahead of it. Um, so I will gladly answer any questions. I think I've covered uh, Doug's and Robin's there, but uh, I'll, I'll be here for a couple more minutes. So again, thank you all for attending this talk and the talks the last couple of days for being storm spotters uh, for our office. We very much appreciate that uh, and everything that you do for us funneling those reports uh, to us. So with that, everybody have a great uh, and wonderful rest of your Saturday. Enjoy football if that's what you're up to today or out and about on this nice mild uh, Saturday evening. Um, Jared uh, has a question. Is there a particular reason KGRK goes down very often? Uh, nothing specific um, and that would be more of a question uh, honestly, for the Fort Worth office uh, than us, since we um, aren't uh, that involved um, with the KGRK radar, other than it being in our CWA, uh, but nothing really specific there. Anybody else with some questions? Okay, so I got a question um, about if we check online, uh, you know, some some radar online, some interactive radar, uh, where is that data coming from? Is it all the GRK radar? Is it all uh, our radar? And it kind of depends um, without knowing the exact site that you're using, without knowing um, some of the details, uh, it, it depends. Some sites uh, may use that MRMS or kind of mosaic data together, which stitches together um, okay, so the KXAN radar online, yeah. So it likely stitches together the, the radar data. It, whenever um, you know an algorithm does that, whether it's MRMS or some other private company, it usually does weight the closer radar uh, more significantly. So I would say you know, it's a concentration of data from the KGRK radar over Round Rock, um, but it is probably likely taking in uh, at least some data from our radar, from the San Angelo radar, from the Fort Worth radar, to, to kind of help shore up um, what you're looking at there. But I think it would be heavily weighted um, to the closer radar, which again, for you would be KGRK. Um, and then Bruce, question about the recording. I do know that we have recorded 
uh, both Paul's earlier talk and this one. Um, I will talk to him after the fact. I don't know if we plan uh, to put these up online like we have recordings of our uh, basing and event Skywarns, but I will talk to Paul. Uh, and if we do put these out on our uh, public website, uh, we'll, we'll put announcements out on social media uh, that we have posted these recordings. So uh, be looking on our Twitter and our Facebook uh, in the coming days um, about, about the potential of recordings there for you, Bruce. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, hearing none, uh, again, thank you for all your kind words, folks. Um, and uh, we will uh, talk to you all later. We will see you on the phone, see you on social media as spotters, and uh, go enjoy the rest of y'all's weekend.